Come on, let's worship him together. Let's worship him in spirit and in truth. We declare that we are chosen. We are children of the Most High God. We are known by him. Even as we are known, we know him. The Lord is bringing you into a deeper relationship of his person, of his presence. He is letting you know who he is and trying to envelop you with his own nature and his own essence. He's filling you with himself right now. He's flooding your home right now with his presence. We are learning in these times that God is not confined. Come on, God is not limited. God is not stuck. God is not put anywhere. There's no box that can keep God in. Not even heaven is big enough to contain God. He opens up its windows and he pours out a blessing that you don't have room enough to receive. The heaven is not a container for God. God is a container for heaven. Heaven is inside of God. God is too big for any environment to confine him. We're learning that you've got to let him pour himself out upon you. Let him immerse you. Let him complete completely baptize you that's what it means to be baptized it means to be completely and totally absolutely dunked in him so let him immerse you let him immerse you let him envelop you let him overcome you come on let him overwhelm you sometimes our emotional response to God's presence is an overwhelming sense of love of goodness of favor of kindness that we don't find anywhere else in the world when we use our eyes or our feelers or senses to search for it around us there's nobody who can equate to the level of outpouring that the father can so so the overwhelming emotion is a signal that my body is being overwhelmed by him. So if you feel the tears welling up from inside of you, I want you to let them flow. If you feel joy and laughter welling up from the inside of you, I want you to go ahead and let it bubble up to eternal life. If you feel something in you that's called a river that Jesus said he would put in your belly that would flow into everlasting life, don't hold it back. Don't contain it. Be like God be uncontainable be like God be all overflowing let it overflow let your worship literally utter up out of you that's the power of tongues when we get filled with the Holy Ghost we cannot contain just his infilling spirit inside of our belly so something comes out of us even more and it comes into an expression that's so if you feel tongues welling up inside of you let it over flow for many it might be the first time it might be a new dimension for you but I want you just for a few more moments to learn how to live in the overflow see in worship we start to only tap into the parts that we're familiar with that we're comfortable with that we're used to we get in the boat in the next time in his presence and we go to the place we were last where there was a marker where there was a spot that we had traveled to before I'm giving you the freedom on this itinerary in worship to travel further than you've ever traveled lift your hands and just worship him elevate his name bless him call him a name you haven't called him that he showed you in the midnight hour in the secret place involve yourself the screen does not have to be uh, uh, literally a recipe or a place that makes me not participate just because we're separated by a glass screen and some distance that's translated through Wi-Fi technology doesn't mean you cannot involve yourself God is calling to your deep God is calling to the places that that you haven't let him have yet let him let him immerse all of that and let it go let it go just like heaven cannot hold God your body cannot hold your praise live beyond your body's limitations live beyond your mind's explanations live beyond the limitations in your heartbeat and just pour it out on him say Lord you're excellent you're worthy you're perfect and you're holy you're just in every single way you're mighty to deliver when man can't reach me you are well able to reach and to perform deeds and mighty acts God because we believe in you we put our trust in you right now the Holy Spirit is doing a divine disruption 
right now the Holy Spirit is releasing divine disruption we've been declaring and we've been knowing that God is bringing a reset this year he is doing that to bring that reinvention we talked about that year of transformation and reinvention of you first of your family and then of the systems and the structures of the earth as we begin to proclaim that word is not going to return unto him void he is doing a reinventive work because he's resetting a matter he's bringing it back to its original place and intention and that happens most perfectly in praise and worship so now come on keep worshiping him keep adoring him keep declaring him there is no place that is closer to heaven on earth than when we sense dominion and when we have worship because heaven is the place of absolute dominion it's where God absolutely rules entirely by his will perfectly there is no place no peace no spot of heaven that is not under the absolute lordship of our heavenly father and Jesus Christ who has ascended and been given a name above every name in heaven or in earth or any realm beneath it or around it he has been given a name above every single name name that is named so heaven is known as the place where God's will is perfectly manifest and the place where worship is first nature not just second nature first nature all eyes are on Jesus I'm sorry all gazes are on Jesus all eyes are on Jesus all praise is unto Jesus right now in our worship the Lord is restoring years he is refreshing he is renewing he is repairing and he is resetting he's getting all the kinks out you know what happens in technology one of the first things that you've got to troubleshoot when something is not working right when there's connectedness but but the flow is not quite there it's hanging up it's slow it's not quite performing listen at optimal capacity computer performance is being drained by all of the things that need its processor and its power to function it's being drained it's got too many applications running at the same time. In other words, it has too many different things wanting its attention at the exact same time. That happens in the body as well. So many things putting a demand on your technology. So many things needing your attention. But you only have a certain amount of processing, a certain amount of capacity that allows you to function at optimal capacity. Come on, some of you need to put force quit on all those applications running in the background that have been grabbing your attention that have been stealing your virtue and your excellence so you can't perform optimally in the spirit of excellence because so many things are pulling you down that your best is really only 15% of you because you're so drained and tired and as soon as you sit down somebody right now needs to hear it as soon as you sit down in a chair your head goes back and you start to fall asleep or you feel a stupor come upon you a sleep come upon you it's because you're too drained but in your in God's presence right now in your proximity that you're being walked into God's person and his presence he's trying to heal that he's trying to release greater virtue he's releasing greater energy he's he's releasing the weight of that stupor that comes upon that sleep that comes upon God is releasing a fresh wind you got to quit it right now how do you quit it you make a decision you make a decision that it will no longer have all of your attention your affection you shut it down that's why the Bible says you have to cast down thoughts that exalt themselves and you've got to bring them into obedience that's how you quit it you cast it down you tell your mind no and you bring it into the obedience of Christ and you speak against it this is no longer going to confine me this is no longer going to hold me this is no longer going to affect me so now the Lord instructs you put a word in your mouth and declare that the things that have been improperly robbing you of energy are no longer going to do it put the word in your mouth say it out loud declare it right now whatever that thing might be that distraction is not going to hold me I quit it I force quit it I force quit addiction I force quit things that have my attention that should not have them I quit them I quit them I quit them I close them I end them and their drain their demand on my virtue is no more is no longer I command it to loose me now and to let me go to live free in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus 
Now watch me a lot of times when you need to troubleshoot why your mind and your heart or a computer is being hung up. You've got to troubleshoot it, but one of the first things anybody will tell you to do is you got to do a restart. You have to have a reset. So that is the same with your mind and your heart. It can get hung up. You're connected spiritually. That's that's for the computer. That's Wi-Fi. That's that's the, the technology in the cloud, right? But in you, you're connected to the realms of the spirit, but you feel glitchy. You feel hung up. You feel like your processor is low. You feel like you can't think as clearly as you should be able to. Speak as clearly as you should be able to. Minister as adequately as you should be able to. There's glitches in it. So when to, when that happens, the first thing you need to do is reset it. Come on. Somebody shout restart. Even in your own home, say restart. In the comments, right? I'm getting a restart. God is trying to restart you. God is trying to reboot you. God is trying to bring you back to the clarity of your original self where nothing improper is binding or grabbing or draining you if you will receive this word right now God is restarting refreshing renewing the weight in your imagination right the improper things clogging you up those things are being restarted in the presence of God let him do the restart let him do the refresh let him get rid of the clogs the kinks the wrinkles let him get rid of them. Say, Holy Spirit, give me a restart. He said that it was called a wind of refreshing. A wind of refreshing in a Kairos moment can come and give you a restart. Your clarity is coming back to you. Somebody hear me right now. Your clarity is coming back to you. The Bible says that great light has shone upon them who sat in great darkness. He said that the eyes of my understanding would be enlightened by the Holy Spirit, by the spirit of revelation. God is opening somebody's eyes again to see. We prophesied at the beginning of 19 that God was going to cause you according to Isaiah to see your way out of obscurity. Somebody right now, your eyes are beginning to open. The obscure measures and matters around you, your eyes are beginning to open. You haven't been able to see God open the the eyes of the spiritual blind open the eyes of the dimensionally blind what does that mean that means that you can't see into the next place God is trying to send you may your eyes be completely open put your hand on your eyes and say let eyes salve come open my eyes Lord open my eyes new understandings new visions new dreams new sights come to you in the name of Jesus new clarity new direction new senses of what what the future holds and will bring god is after that it's happening in the presence of god because he's restoring unto you your identity in him he's restoring unto you who you are in the presence of the holy one do it holy spirit now minister 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 deeply minister purely come upon a people grip them from their headship senses god grip them open things up let senses be trained, Holy Spirit. God is invading now. He's invading. He's healing. He's mending. He's clarifying. In the name of Jesus Christ, Yeshua's name has entered your home. The Holy Spirit's presence has entered your home. He's putting together the broken pieces of relational structure and constitution with kids, spouses, family members, with yourself. Today we're going to learn how to relate to yourself at certain levels. You're going to get a restoration to who God says you are. A reconnection in your heart and your mind with who God says you are. Because your wrestling is not others because a lot of people listening want to please others so much that it's, it's easy for them externally to adapt to the needs of those that are around them. But God is saying, I'm reconciling you with yourself today. In the reconciliation of me and you, you're going to find who you are in me and who I am in you. I'm reconciling you with you. You're at conflict with yourself. And the Spirit of God is trying to break down that conflict. He's trying to end the wrestling match that you have within you. The door, the ding 
of the fighting bell that you hear in your own self and you war with yourself in the mirror and you war with yourself in your studies and you war with yourself in your performance the Lord is saying I'm trying to heal that I reconcile that right now I bring you back to how I see you father minister to a people right now that they would see themselves the way the father sees them in the name of Jesus Woo! this is bringing deliverance to somebody this is setting a captive one free this is letting you loose right now you have felt in bondage to belief systems and opinions that other people put upon you at young ages now I declare those chains break off of your life the anointing is not limited right now it breaks it off of you in the name of Jesus you are completely free stretch out now even in the physical stretch yourself out and shake yourself loose it is a symbol a prophetic sign that God just loose the shackles off of you now in the name of Jesus we declare the works of the devil that have been opportunistic bringing exposure to the breaches in your own soul now he must loose you and let you go he must leave you harassment ends in Jesus name the demonic harassment ends over your life in the name of Jesus. Come on, we don't just believe in communication. We believe in demonstration. Harassment ends in your life in the name of Jesus. He is demonstrating the might of his power. The kingdom, the power, and the glory belongs to you. Manifest it all. He said that when the kingdom of God comes upon you, the, he, the demons have to leave you. When a devil is cast out, he said it is a witness that the kingdom of heaven is upon you. I declare clear every hindrance or harassments bind and break we bind them on you we break them off you we declare they are loosed from you in Jesus mighty name the matchless name of Jesus Christ steps into your being right now if you have a prayer language I need you to pray if you know somebody is getting this I need you to pray there is a deliverance that God is bringing upon you now He's setting you free. Come on, send in that testimony. You got an opportunity to share. The Bible says the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Testify even in the comment field of how God is setting you free. And let it prophesy to somebody else in another nation that will tune in and see this, that God is going to do the same in their life. Come on, say it, say it, testify of it. It's falling off you today. It's falling off of you today. God is reconciling you with you hey in the name of Jesus there is a deep thing God is doing in the personhood of the equation to bring back his original intent in your mind and your heart and your soul there are great things he's wanting to do and he needs you right to manifest them he needs you to get your mind clear the fog to go need you to get in come on now he needs you to get in get in position these are days of great repositioning because of what reposturing we talked about he needs you to get set now he needs you to get set to get in position to be where you're supposed to be but now that restart you just got in the presence just washed out every kink it just washed out all the all the hang-ups the prayer hang-ups the fasting hang up see because you were able to fast easily in seasons before now you can go a couple hours and you feel hung up on it why God just reset you he just reset you your prayer you can pray for five minutes and then you're distracted used to be able to pray for 30 and not be distracted used to be able to pray for two hours and not be distracted somebody's capacity is there's too much demand on you right now and you've quit some things and now by the spirit he just reset you so now you'll be able to enter into prayer the way you used to pray if you trust him You'll be able to enter into worship. And I'm saying if you had this experience because it is in his presence deeply that he brought a reset. See, when they reboot something, it goes into the very mainframe of the, of the individual system or the, the hardware system. See, if you let him do it in that moment of worship, he just resets something. So now the, 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 the spiritual disciplines will become easy for you again. They'll become graced for you again. Because it wasn't that the grace left your life. Hear me. It wasn't that the grace lifted off your life. Or that you were in a better spiritual place prior. 
for the ones I'm talking to, for some it could be, but for the ones I'm talking to, it is not even that you were in a better place at that point. It's just that you had too many things running in the background and you had hangups and God is resetting that. God is restarting that. He's washing those measures out and he's bringing a refreshing. <laughs> Woo! He's bringing a refreshing. I need you to receive that by faith. I need you to receive that by faith. Grab that. Grab that. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's what's in reach. It's somebody's got to take it. Grab that. Grab it. Grab that reset for your life. Grab that reset for your marriage. Grab that reset for your own spirituality. Grab it. Grab it. Grab it. Grab it. Grab it and thank him for it now. Bless him for it now. You will see tangibly. You will see practically the benefits of that restart God just did. You know what happens is now there's room cleared for something else to be downloaded. <laughs> now there's room cleared for the update that couldn't process before to be processed. So now, now God brings an update to you. Now God brings another measure to you, another realm to you right now. That's what's about to happen as we get into the Word of God. Now God brings another realm to you, to equip you, to upgrade you, to get you ready precisely in position for your purpose and the production in position. That will get your life back in position and get you postured and set up right for the move God is bringing in your world. Now, we're, we're declaring and walking along, line, along the lines of what the Spirit has been releasing in this hour and in this day. And He is working aggressively. And we feel it inside of our own mantle. He's working aggressively to get a generation together. To emerge them to be ready and equipped to live their assignment. To be about the Father's business. He said, and in, in, in this today, I think there's going to be a lot of reconciliation with the identity piece. We're going to deal a lot with the personhood in the destiny equation because I believe the Holy Spirit is wanting to bring amending to the identity areas of your life. He wants to download and refresh and restart your heart and your mind in the revelation of who you are in him and who he is in you and begin to communicate to you to come to a clarity of your identity in God. Because without that, and we'll talk about this, without that your destiny will not be fulfilled. It will be maligned. It will not have the weight or the substance that you're supposed to carry and that it should be manifesting won't happen if your identity is all over the place. If you're unsure of who you are in God, 
and who God designed you to be in the midst of the earth. So we got to understand this. And, and when we're dealing with the realm of destiny, you got to realize in God, the revelation that he gives us in him is that before you were in your mother's belly, in your mother's womb, God already knew you. Now, when you think about that word, no, it is a deep revelation of. It's a deep acquaintance with. We know that it has intimacy built into it. God already knew you. Every piece of you, every part of you, every portion of you was in the knowledge of God. So then your identity was settled before the world even saw you. Now here is where the conflict immenses and begins to commence rather here's where the conflict commences because when you come into the earth you automatically from the time you break from the womb of mom you automatically have somebody naming you now that is not a challenge that is not uh, inappropriate because they need to have an identifier for who you are but as soon as you come into the world you can see the conflict because you already have individuals before your eyes are even open matter of fact a lot of times before they even intended to have you they already had names for you now the names again it is appropriate for parenting for fatherhood and for motherhood to release names on children but what I'm saying is you have to recognize that the understanding of this is as soon as you breach the womb of mama, you already have voices putting names on your life. So you already have things in this realm attempting to identify the being that just came from the belly. They're already trying to identify you. So you can fathom then by putting that logical piece together that if they do not tap into the mind of God on who you are, that they're not going to be able to connect who you are with the body coming out of that belly. They're not going to be able to do so. So already you have a society that we enter into that is at conflict with identity. Unfortunately, when you're born into a society and a nature that doesn't align themselves vertically with the things of the kingdom of heaven, then they're automatically unable to find God's knowledge about who you are. This is a conflict and a challenge because if God knew you before you were in your mother's belly and then you got a hundred people outside of your mother's belly trying to name you outside of God's knowledge, that's a problem because you didn't hear God and all of his knowledge about you when you came out of that belly. Your faculties were not trained. Your spirit needs to be developed. Your soul needs time to form. You All you know how to do is cry and feed at this point. You can barely open your eyes to see the light of the world, let alone the light of the heavens. So you are at conflict now. Automatically, you're being pressured. You're being pushed upon. You're being defined by people who didn't counsel God. If you're in a culture that isn't connected with the Father, thankful for those homes and houses that have godly parents who have been praying about who you were before you ever came into the belly. But let's be honest, even a lot of Christians aren't seeking God on who their children are before they come into the world. That's not condemnation, that's just reality. And so their conversation that they're beginning to have with that beautiful child who has a calling on their life, they're figuring it out as they go. They see sparks of genius in that kid as that kid starts to navigate through life so they see him pick up a ball they see him touch a piano key they see him navigate to a string and my god he must be destined to perform on new york and Times square because they're trying to piece it together by your instincts okay now you have instincts in you that will lead you to the call of god on your life the the conflict i'm trying to draw definity and, and uh, a line into for you to see clearly is that they're attempting to figure you out as you go God already knew you before you were in mom's belly and they're trying to figure you out as you go now let me let me set this on the table because there are parts of life that are mysteries I'm not saying that those outside of that conversation God had with himself which would include everybody that they can automatically pick all of that out 
perfectly and with specificity. So the only things that they say to you would be God's will. I'm not saying that because we all are walking in realms of mystery. But we should try to pursue God before we give people names. We should, we should try to pursue God before we define somebody's life. I hope you hear what I'm saying. We should try to find the knowledge of God on somebody and perceive what God's will might be. In other words, I should recognize the wisdom of God on a young kid's life before they make a mistake and I call them stupid. I should probably pick up that God might have a genius in them and call them that. And maybe I can apply some grace. So now listen, again, the revelation doesn't come for condemnation. I feel like I need to, I need to, I need to smooth everything out this morning for you. So please get your sensitive piece off. Put that in the closet. Hang that on in the shelf on the hanger. And let me talk to you so I can get you in your destiny, all right? Because, you know, you can perceive people's thoughts. So this is God. God is trying to say, listen, just have some grace. So listen, we did the best we could with what we had. Now we're coming into greater knowledge so we can do better. Let's just say that. We're coming into greater knowledge so we can do better. So when we walk into the revelation of somebody's naming, I should be trying to find the Father's name first. What did God say about them? Perceive. That's why Paul taught us, know no man after the flesh. He said, you used to know those who walked with Jesus for a time. He said, you used to know the Savior after the flesh, but know we him this way no longer. Now we know him after the Spirit, after his ascension, Paul said. So he said, that is a revelation for us to understand that they mistreated Christ because they didn't know him after the Spirit. They mistreated the one who was perfect, flawless, mistake-free, absolutely walking in the purity of the knowledge of God. They mistreated him. They misrecognized him. They mismanaged him. So if the world did that to the Christ who came perfectly in the knowledge of God, how much more is it going to do it to you and me? All right? So he said, now then we shouldn't know anybody after the flesh. As much as depends on us, we should have the ability to perceive somebody after the Spirit so that we don't name them wrong and we don't honor them inappropriately or dishonor them or honor them in a proportion underneath what they should be honored because render to all men that which is due and honor all the Bible says. So he says you got to learn how to tap into God's knowledge about who somebody is. And when you begin to tap into that, listen, it's hard for you to tap into the knowledge of God about somebody else when you haven't even done it about yourself. If you don't know who God called you, it's going to be hard. You're going to be hard pressed to understand what God called them. So you got to understand what God is saying about your life. So God knew you perfectly before you were even in your mother's belly. His knowledge of you is pure. His knowledge of you is perfect. We enter into a world that has an innate conflict with the call that is on our life. Everything pressures us to be something they think we should be. That's from the places that we grow up in. That's from the media that we now draw attention to. That's from peer pressure. That's every level in our lives now. We have other things trying to define who I'm supposed to be. What is a man? What is a woman? What is a child? What is a parent? What is a father? What is a mother? Who are you? Who am I? Everything is trying to define or redefine who you are you actually are so you are born into a conflict like Jacob where you are wrestling between yourself you are wrestling with who you are called by God to be Israel born into the earth as Jacob growing up second when you're called first and trying to figure out how to get a blessing that is rightfully yours that since the father doesn't know you he won't put it upon your life you're in conflict with the things that you should have had from before time began that wrestling match is good for your character amen we're gonna talk about it it's good for your character so you can grow in who you are called to be that conflict is is difficult to manage as a human so I've got to learn how to connect with God so I can come into a reconciliation of my identity in Christ everybody pre-Jesus is being is living their life according to definitions that the Heavenly Father never intended every person on planet earth before Jesus is wrestling through misidentity, misplaced identity. They do not know who they are because your life is hidden with Christ in God. Your life is hidden with God in Christ. 
your life is hidden in him. So you cannot come to the fullness of the revelation of who you are until you get a revelation of who he is. It says, as we see him, we become even as he is. We're in this world. He's ascended. But when we see him, we become who he is. So listen, we will become the thing that has our attention. We will become whatever has our eyesight at a dominant level. That is what we're becoming. So outside of Jesus, you're not looking at Jesus. So you're becoming everything else that has your attention. And for many, even inside of Jesus, they're not looking unto Jesus. This is why Hebrews had to tell somebody, look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. If you had to say it, it's because a lot of people aren't consistently doing so. And John said, when he appears, we shall see him as he is and will become, even as he is, but in this world. We'll be transformed into the same image that we see. So in him, there is an identity, there is a knowledge of who we are that is awakened when we see Jesus. And when we see Jesus, who we are begins to awaken on the inside of us. So a lot of times when we come through the line of conversion and through the line of revelation, we talked about this in week one, when you are translated out of the culture that you're in into an entirely different culture, now you've got a reconciliation that has to take place. The one Christ bought for us is entire reconciliation. The reconciliation that happens immediately is the one between you and the Father. The other parts take time. The reconciliation with who God called you to be, which is different than who you think you are. At the point of entrance through the door of Jesus, that takes a little bit of time. So through time, you're wrestling with your own identity. Oh, do I have anybody real listening to me right now? You're wrestling through your own identity. You're wrestling through who you are, who God called you to be, what you think you're supposed to do, who you're supposed to please, whether or not it is the Father, Jesus, whether or not it is yourself, your friends, your family. You're wrestling through this process of identification. And the thing that you've got to realize is you are a vital person peace in the purpose of God for your life. You got to understand you are a vital peace in the purpose of God for your life. God is working in you. He who has begun a good work where? In you. Did he say who has begun a good work outside of you? Is faithful to complete it until the end? Sure, God watches over every single word to perform it. He is going to establish every single word he announced in your life. But the apostle said, he who has begun a good work in you is faithful to perform it to the end. So the reconciliation process is exactly that. It is a process where he is working a work inside of you. He's doing a work in you to reconcile your own sight with who you are called to be. Now let's look at this conflict. James said that when you look into the perfect law of liberty and you behold, it's like looking into a mirror. That means when you get into the word of God and you hear the word of God spoken and you get into the word of God, it is like looking into a spiritual mirror. And the reflection of revelation, because revelation is a light, the reflection of revelation that comes from the word of God shines back to you who you actually are. But he said that most people walk away from that mirror and forget how they look. Most people get into the knowledge of what God said about me and how God knew me before time began, and they walk away from that mirror, and they forget how they look. Now think about this conflict. Your eyes are set amongst your members in such a way where the only person you cannot see without outside help is you. You are the only person you cannot see without some external apparatus. You need assistance from something else to help you see you. Woo! That's why you need to be accountable to spiritual leadership because you can't even see yourself right. 
It is the light of the eye, the revelation of the leader that God trusts you in that allows them to really see and them, God to help you see the things inside of you that not only and not even you can see. So you've got to be subject to spiritual authority. You have to uh, honestly live your life in a culture of honor, which we're going to deal with in this details of destiny because, boy, this is helping somebody. This is going to get us in position. We're going to deal with that culture because you cannot fulfill your destiny out Side of the culture of honor it is impossible I need you to be writing these notes now write down I cannot fulfill my assignment outside the culture of honor I need it it is it is not possible to do but now let's deal with this go back to this so when the when the people see you uh, they begin to see who you are now I'm not saying that everybody else knows you better than you I just talked to you about the conflict I'm saying that God sets it up in such a way that we need an orderly balance and an orderly kingdom system for the revelation of our identity. So your eyes are set so you can't see you without something else helping you see you. Naturally speaking, you got to go to a mirror. You got to look into a reflective surface. You got to go to water. You got to find something in nature that reflects you back to you. You got to look at glass. You got to look at your back of your phone. You got to look at something that gives you a reflection to even know what you look like. But how many people, let's just be honest now, this is so funny when I think about this. How many people, you get up in the mirror, you do all the stuff you need to do, you get your hair did, you get your te teeth brushed, you get your, your breath right. You get your hair lined up, fellas. You get everything in shape. You got the beard oil in. You rocking and you're ready. You dress. You done checked everything. And then you walk away from the mirror. And five minutes later, can you really tell me exactly what you look like? There is a challenge, even naturally speaking, where, where a lot of people walk away from a mirror and don't even have burned into their psyche what they look like naturally. And they spent an hour in front of the mirror. They got to go back to it again to get a fresh look at what you are and what you look like. If that's the case in the natural, how much more in the spirit? So he said, if you walk away from the perfect law of liberty and you're not a doer of the work, you're not a doer of the word, you don't put things in practice, then you will not actually remember how you're supposed to look on a spiritual level. So when revelation comes into your life, your responsibility is to live it. Write it down. When revelation comes into my life, my responsibility is to live it. If I don't live it, if I don't put the word into practice, I forgot it. I'm a forgetful hearer. I am not becoming because the point of revelation is to become. Write it down. The point of revelation is to become. The point of revelation is not information. The point of revelation is transformation. Revelation brings an altar in form, trans the formation. So when revelation comes, it shifts you. So if it isn't changing how you behave, you didn't get it yet. If it's not changing how you function, you haven't got it yet. If it hasn't become habit, it's not a habitation. Because your habits are the result of your habitation. And the ultimate place you live is in the world constructed by your habits. Your habits are your, oh my goodness, your habits are your life's habitation. So revelation comes to bring transformation. So when revelation hits your life, it's to make you become something. So our desire then, when revelation comes, it actually should stir a fire for us to become what we, what we see we should be. So in the word, in preaching, in the presence of God, when we get a revelation, it lights a fire for us to become what we should be in the presence of God by that revelation. So every revelation that I get should ignite a flame in me to become what I just saw. You hear what I said? It ignites a flame in me to become what I just saw. So when God opens a realm of revelation, it should ignite a hunger. Now, at that point, I won't be an expert in it, but I should be hungry for it. I'm going to say it again. At the point of revelation, I don't need to be an expert in it, but I need to be hungry for it. All right? I need to increase my appetite and my desire. I should now desire to get what I just saw in the realm of the spirit. 
So the word of God is a spiritual mirror that shows you who you actually are. And when you walk away from it and attempt to live it, then, all right, good, it's becoming a part of your identity. And just like you got to go to the mirror every day, every morning, some people twice and ten times a day, whatever, go to the mirror multiple times to get yourself right, you got to go to the word multiple times to make sure your hairline ain't off, your makeup ain't fell apart, right? You got to make sure your, your breath is still good. You don't need a mirror for that, but, you know, most people brush their teeth in a mirror. So you got to go back to it to make sure everything looks right. Now, why? If you go to that mirror and you see some dirt up on your face or you see that you've been crying in worship and, and, and the girl's mascara is all over the place or you see you just got done at the barber and home slice put your line two inches back, right? When you get into the mirror, that helps you know where your life is headed. I'm just playing. That helps you know where you are so you can make an adjustment to what you just saw in the mirror. But if you don't go back to the mirror, you will have no idea that all this stuff in life affected your visage. You hear what I'm saying, somebody? So you got to go back to the mirror to make the adjustment. This is why as spiritual people, as kingdom people, we have to go back to the Constitution, the revelation of the king's word, back to the word of God, and we have to study the word of God. And in the word of God, we can see, is my, is my eye off a little bit? Is my line back a little bit? Is my stuff not working right? So I can clean the dirt off my face that the world put on me and look the way Jesus told me I'm supposed to look. I hope you hear me right now. This is going to change somebody's world. So when you get into the word of God, get in it to get a revelation of God and in the revelation of God, a revelation of yourself. Every single, you need to write this down, every single time God verbalizes and vocalizes or speaks, he is hiding a measure of you in what is spoken. I need you to write it down. Every single time that the Lord verbalizes and vocalizes or speaks, right? Those are just the dynamics of speaking. Every time God speaks, he has hid a measure of you in whatever is spoken. He has hid you in the word. So he said that, that, that your life is hidden with Christ and God. Your life is in Christ. Christ is the word. So anytime he speaks, he releases a part of you. So it is not just about the instruction I obey. It is also about the person I become. And if I disobey it, not only do I not accomplish the instruction, I become disobedient. I become something that opposes the nature he just gave me in the instruction. You hear what I'm saying? So this revelation actually has inside of it a measure of who you actually are anointed to be. See, and you are an important piece of your own purpose. We get caught up in the work of purpose and we forget about the person in purpose. See, in the destiny equation, you got to understand that you are a vital part in that assignment. Now, listen to this in Judges. We're going to reread this because last week when we started dealing with the destiny equation, I got a lot of people asking me to do a part two to this. I intended to move on to the next part of the details of destiny, but, but uh, a lot of people were asking that we redo the destiny equation. So I got it on behind me, and we're going to try to break this down, and we're going to look at some pieces of it that we didn't get a chance to touch on in last week's conversation or in the last uh, video, the last training, all right? So let's reread Judges chapter number 6 just so you have a scriptural context that we're digging this idea out of. Verse number 11, Judges chapter number 6, verse number 11. We're dealing with the personhood for just a minute. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree, which was in Oprah, which belonged to Joash the Ebezerite, um, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in a wine press in order to hide it from the Midianites. Now the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. This shocked Gideon in verse 13. My Lord, if the Lord is with us, then why has all this happened to us? If the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? So they had a revelation, like most people who get to God do, that if God is with you, what's happening around you should be different. 
If God is with you, what's happening around you should be different. Let me just drop that prophetically into somebody's spirit real quick, that because God is with you, something different is going to happen around you. Because God is with you, even in the seeming circumstantial conflict, God is releasing and using that to release a measure of greater destiny and purpose and assignment. Because God is with you, something different is happening around you. Somebody's faith needs to be built on the revelation that God is with you. He is Emmanuel. He is God with us. Since God is with me, I can expect something different to happen around me. So since God is with me, I can expect that it might fall a 1,000 at my left hand and 10,000 at my right hand, but not come near my dwelling. And the only answer is God is with me. Say that to yourself. God is with me. You'll feel your boldness go to the next level when you say 10 times, God is with me. I don't care about the conflict, the battle, the smiting on the left or the right cheek. God is with me. You don't like me. God is with me. You're not with me. God is with me. See, you don't understand me. God is with me. That, that'll put something in your spirit. See, when nobody else is for you, you got to have the revelation of Emmanuel. God is with me. And when God is with you, you can expect different things to happen around you so say it 10 times in the midst of rona virus god is with me god is with me rona and all her cousins can stay away because god is with me all the imps that are along with this demon can go because god is with me and since god is with me he is my shield he is my buckler he is my my strong tower god is with me come on shout it put a comment in there and say god is with me in your house announce in the atmosphere of your house God is with me. Now watch though. There are times when we have a conflict because since God and if God is with me, why is all this befalling me? It's a process. It's a journey. It's a struggle that Gideon is in because his culture was a people who were not living for the things of God. They repented. The prophet came uh, uh, just before this piece of it. Now watch this. He said, uh, et cetera, et cetera, God's not with us. Why all this befall us? Verse number 14, the Lord turned unto him through the angel and said, go in this thy might. Go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? So he said, oh, my Lord, how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least of my father's house. In other words, I'm the least of the least of the least of the least. How are you going to use me? Now watch. God knew more about Gideon than Gideon knew about Gideon. Gideon is having an identity conflict. Gideon is wrestling with who he actually is. Gideon is shocked when God calls him what God knew he was before time began. See, when God gives us revelation of who we actually are in the spirit and who he designed and, and uniquely destined us to be. When God gives us that, it comes into such conflict with what I've been called by the culture that I almost don't believe him. So now your inner belief system about who you are starts wrestling against what God says you actually are. So you come into this, this challenge of trying to come into reality and to grips with who God actually calls you. So this is the wrestling match that not only is Gideon in, you are in as well, us as people, because we've been called something else our entire life. And suddenly God starts calling us something entirely different. And so now it's this, this uh, conflict, this combating this battle, this war of nature and identity. And Gideon says, I'm going to look at what's around me to describe what's in me. Whew, see, this is the problem. You can never create identity by looking at what's around you. You can never limit what's in you by what you see around you. That will always be a conflict that will never line itself up, that will never work out right if you are trying to define who you are by what you have. But that's called the world. Worldliness defines who they are by what they have, what they've achieved, what they've accomplished. The problem with that is you go into seasons of success 
and you come into seasons of difficulty. And that means that you believe in yourself when you're doing well, and you hate yourself when you're doing bad. That's too bipolar. That is not godly. That is not righteous. Because you have judged who you are by what you're going through. That is, that is, uh, um, uh, that is a child level of thinking. The world is absolutely over when I don't get what I want or when I didn't get what I thought I should have or when something happened differently. Now, I'm not saying that you can't come into a point where you get tested because when God wants to dig deeper into your identity, he'll blow past all your understanding and he'll make all your circumstances start looking exactly opposite of what he said you were called to do because he's doing a character work. And he's not doing a quick work on the outside. But see, most people live there. And see, if you listen to me without becoming dull of hearing, I'm telling you, that right there will set you free. Because many of your challenges, when we start talking about the person part of the destiny equation, is that you are still defining yourself by what's around you. If you have a good day, you know who you are. You're confident in who you are. You're great. You have a bad day. You're down on yourself. You beat yourself up. See, you don't know how to speak to yourself yet the things that God has said to you see David encouraged himself in the Lord not when he was sitting on the throne and everybody loved him he encouraged himself in the Lord after they robbed him of their wives and their possessions and they went out on a scouting mission thinking that where they were currently living was safe and they came back and it was all snatched away from them and his leaders who loved him now hated him and they wanted to kill him it was then that David said he encouraged himself in the Lord. So you got to learn how to speak to yourself on your worst day. On your worst day, you got to learn to speak to yourself. Get you a piece of paper. Can I give you an apostolic instruction, a homework assignment that I'm going to ask you if you did next week? Get you a piece of paper. Write on top of it identity. I want you to fill the front and the back page with small letters, not big letters. you got to write like me. Not like my wife. My wife got beautiful, amazing letters that every time she writes, it looks like papyrus put a card together. If y'all know who that is, it looks like, it looks like, I mean, it just, it's amazing. It's beautiful. It's incredible. I love it. It's, it's, it's fantastic. I don't even know how to write cursive no more, but man, her handwriting is just exceptional. So don't write like her because she can write like two sentences and half the page be taken. Write like me, you know, like the doctor scribble. All I'm saying for that is I need you to start finding out who you are. You need you to start finding out who you are. Your destiny depends on you knowing the person part of the destiny equation. So get you a piece of paper, and I'm going to make it easy. Fill the, the back. Yeah, that's easy. Fill the front and the back with revelation of who you are. The front and the back with revelation of who you are. And then turn that into, you're going to need another page for this part, turn that into declarations, I am statements, all right? Turn that into I am statements. And take 10 minutes every morning with those identity pieces, using those as I am statements. Does that make sense? Phase one, get a piece of paper. Phase two, write like a doctor scribble. Phase three, fill the front and the back page with identity statements. Phase four, turn them into I am statements. Phase five, 10 minutes every morning speaking them. So when you get to the trial of your life, you, it's easy for you to encourage yourself in the Lord. You hear what I'm saying to you? So you are not wrestling with God's language. Gideon has an angel come and announce to him his assignment. The man's purpose. Gideon has an angel show up and start speaking purpose into his life. And because the person was, mal was malfunctioning, because the person was fractured, because the person didn't believe the identity and the nature of what God had called them to do, the gift, the might part, could not be manifested and the destiny was about to be sabotaged. He had the God that made him tell him who he was, and he spoke against it. Now, this is what we do. God starts to announce assignment over our life, and we act like we know ourselves better than God knows us. And so we start wrestling with what God said. We do it more than we realize. We do it more than we realize. You know, when we do it, we do it in the subtle conversations we have with ourselves, our spouses, our friends, when we're down when we don't think God is listening, when, we, when we're not thinking through it, 
we say stuff that doesn't align with the assignment of God. And that is me internally still fighting against what God said that I am. So when somebody calls you who you are, accept it. And just walk in it and stop wrestling with that particular thing in your life. But he is dealing with this struggle because the scarcity that he's wrestling with. And Gideon's in a place, just like the nature, uh, I'm sorry, the nation of Israel. Gideon is in a place where his circumstances don't match his assignment. So he starts to think, he starts to allow the scarcity, hear me, the famine that's happening in the land of Israel on the outside. He starts make, making him think that that creates a deficit on who he is on the inside so the scarcity outside starts making him scarce on the inside and now he's at a deficit in his own beliefs of his own self because the scarcity outside starts getting inside of him so now he's starting to get scarce in the midst of what he is called and anointed to do and so and so we, we then have to walk in a revelation of the assignment of God on our particular life. All right? That makes sense? So God says, I'm going to deal with scarcity. I'm going to deal with scarcity in the midst of manifesting destiny in somebody's life. I'm going to deal with scarcity in the midst of manifesting destiny in somebody's life. So let's deal with the person. When you start to look at the destiny equation, I put the second and, and couple letters in it so you could get it at this point. Purpose person plus person multiplied by time and favor equals your destiny you should have got that last week purpose and person now the personhood that we're dealing with today is broken into identity nature and gift now watch me because it, when you start to deal with these levels there are seven dimensions of elevation that i call them seven dimensions of elevation you got the gift jesus taught this you got the gift number one right one gift number two you have the person Number three, after the gift and the person, you have the house or the temple. Number four, you have the heavens. Number five, you begin to have the thrones. So you've got the gift, you've got the person, you've got the house, right, the temple, you've got the heavens, you've got the throne. These things begin to be established and they have to be set in order if we're going to walk in the level we're supposed to. I think I missed the altar. So you've got the gift, you've got the person, you've got the altar as number three. Number four, you've got the house or the temple. Number five, you've got the heavens. Number six, you've got the thrones. And number seven, you have the Lord King or God who sits on the throne. So that means then that the gift is the first level. Person is the second level. Altar is the third level. Now watch this. Jesus said, if you have alt against a person, your brother, lay your gift, the first level, on the altar, which is the third level, and go get it right with the person on the second level, or your gift won't have any use. I won't be able to pour out from God through the throne and the temple onto the altar to activate the gift. God said, if you want me to use the gift, you got to deal with the person the right way. A lot of times we exalt the talent above the person, but the person is a level above the talent. The gift is only as good as the person that bears it. Write it down. The gift is only as good as the person that bears it. So he said, if you've got a great gift, you're ready to submit to God, but you got a problem with the person, you got to get that level right before your gift can ascend into a next level because your gift is not just your talent it is the wholeness of your person so I got to go get my life right with the person that I've got ought against or my gift will be stopped will be stifled will be hampered will be hindered won't have the expression of the greatest measures of glory so I've got to make the gift subject to the person and the person needs to be subject to the altar did you hear what I said? Romans chapter number 12 says that I have to become a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto him. So then I need to learn how to put my life on the altar. So if I'm a gifted person, level one and two are good, but I don't have an altar in my life, that, lit, that gift will never be activated by supernatural power because the person has not been subject to an altar. I got to learn how to build an altar. An altar is where I'm transformed. An altar is where the personhood is shifted, where the identity of the individual is changed for the better. The altar is the place that that transformation begins to take place, and you begin to become who you are called to be. Now watch, Jesus said to the people, follow me 
and I will make you fishers of men. Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. So who you are is more important or firstly important, I should say, than what you do. You've got to do something, but who you are is the outflow of what you're assigned to do. This is what begins to happen. Who you are comes before what you do. So follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. I will give you something to do, but first I'm going to tell you who you are. See, doing should come out of being and not being out of doing. People attach their being to their doing. They attach who they are to what they do. Then if what they do changes, who they are changes. That's why people get kind of messed up in their mind, schizophrenic in their heart. They get a little bit, they get a little nervous. They get a little, uh, they got multiple identities because when what you do shifts, if you have built who you are into what you do, then what, when what you do changes, then who you are is destabilized. And now you're teetering and tottering because what you do shifted. But can I tell you something? Even though your destiny is secure and your purpose is settled, the methods through which you manifest that will change but who you are is stable in God and who you are is changing in the depth of what God has called you to be and who God has called you to uh, uh, what God has anointed you to manifest does that make sense so God calls you for something God assigns you for something and God begins to charge you for something to walk in the assignment he's called you to walk in amen so he said I'm gonna make you fishers of men and he asked him a question, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? Now notice what Jesus did. Jesus asked the question of identity, and he put the answer to the question inside the question. So he wanted them to know, whatever they say doesn't affect what I believe. Because I know who I am. I put the answer in the question. Who do men say that I, the son of man, am? If you don't know who you are, trust me, everybody else will give you a definition. Everybody else will attempt to help you with it. If you don't know who you are in God, everybody else's answer will start to pull you into that. See, he, everyone else knows them better. This is how people live. They live like everyone else knows them better than they know themselves. The problem with that is then you start living through other people. Some say I'm Elijah. Some say I'm one of the prophets. Oh, really? One of the prophets. I made them. Some say I'm Elijah, right? So you start living through somebody else. That's what social media has done for people. That's, that's what a lot of these filters have done. Now you're living through somebody else. Now you're living like a whole nother lens, but God is trying to bring you back to the revelation of your own self. Now let me close this down, and we can break into more of this as we get through the details of destiny. When God gives you a, 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 a person, what God does, I'm dealing with the threefold court of a person, right? Identity, nature, and gift. God has to stabilize the identity and end the identity crisis. So he can let you come to grips with who you are. Then he's got to give you nature, which, I, which is made up of God's character integrity and his image and likeness the nature of a thing in this culture there is such a battle for the nature there is a wrestling match for the nature who is what what is who what is this what is that but if that is unsure if that is in question if you don't know that you're made in the image and likeness of God if you don't understand that your character is the stabilization of whatever gift you think you got that's why gift is smaller because if that is not right, your gift will bring you to places that your character cannot keep you. And when this whole personhood comes together, you've got the identity set. You've got the nature of God growing on the inside of you. And the person is right, Gideon. All of a sudden, God can begin to activate you to hit what I call acceleration, which is the accelerative factors of this right here. That is time and favor. Those are the multipliers. Those are the accelerators. Some, somebody write time is an accelerator and write favor is an accelerator. 
Somebody write the time accelerator and the favor accelerator. When God makes known who you are and he gets you right and you stop wrestling with yourself and stop wrestling with who you are called to be and he gets you real and you're looking into the word of God and what you see is what you become and you stop walking away and living different than what you're seeing in the word of God. This person is healed. Now God can release the time accelerator and the favor accelerator. Both of these speed up your life. Life. Both of these will multiply your assignment. The time accelerator means that, that time, a kairos, will be dropped into your life and God will speed you up in the realm of your anointing and calling. Wow. So time is broken into chronos and kairos. Chronos is the process of time. Kairos is a set appointment, a destined moment, a supernatural moment on the calendar of heaven where once it hits, anybody who's in the vicinity and on on the on the uh, 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 schedule of that calendared event is accelerated in that Kairos moment. So if God said this is going to happen and your name is written into that, you know how when you set up a meeting, you put a title on the meeting and you got to invite people to the meeting. When God invites you to that moment, when you are in a moment God has made you for and the time zone opens acceleration begins to hit your life and then what i call combustion starts to kick in that is the fire and the oil now explosion begins to hit because the time has come and your velocity begins to increase and you start to travel at speeds you are not even made naturally to travel at god begins to accelerate your life when your time shows up let me preach to somebody this is not just a normal time in history there are kairos moments being dropped right now and people who are in position people who have been scheduled for this you have been made for this hour and this hour has been made for you God is about to open up a timing door where you will hit acceleration in your life and then the favor multiplier is about to drop on somebody favor is when God makes somebody want to do for you what you couldn't do by yourself favor is when God puts you on the king's heart and they want to participate in your good pleasure favor is when somebody wants to help you get somewhere that you couldn't get you can get somewhere in one day of favor that you couldn't have got in one year of labor favor is an accelerator when God gives you favor he advances the causes of men favor is broken from two different people flows from two different beings God and man both of them are important, but the favor of God more so. Because if man gives you favor, man can stop the favor. And man's favor can only flow so far. But if man stops the favor and God keeps giving favor, he'll put another man in the place to give you another measure of favor. It was favor on Joseph's life that made him elevate above the other slaves and above the other inmates and in the eyes of Pharaoh. It was favor that gave him a coat of many colors when his brothers had nothing like that in their entire life to aware it was favor that made Ruth get handfuls of purpose and marry into wealth after a season of poverty it was favor that put Esther from the low place of Mordecai to the high place of the queen it was favor that saved Israel from utter destruction because favor is an accelerator somebody write the favor accelerator favor is an accelerator when God puts you on somebody's heart now understand you get favor by being a solution which we're going to deal with in the details of destiny as we get a little bit further in this but favor is an accelerator favor will speed your life up and put you far beyond where you actually should be favor means that somebody somewhere can put anybody anywhere somebody somewhere can put anybody anywhere Favor means that everything you need is within somebody's reach. And they have it in their heart to change their hand to bless them instead to bless you. They want to put you somewhere they could be. But God turns their heart to like you. It is favor that gave Daniel time. It is favor that saved all the leaders' lives. Favor is the accelerator Number two in the destiny equation. I prophesy over somebody's life today as he reconciles you with who you are. The deep work of identity that's being done in your life today. He's going to be able to show favor because if favor falls on a fractured vessel, it'll be wasted and unused because favor has to be managed. 
as much as it is released. So God says, I'm reconciling you with you because I'm about to put some accelerators in your life. I'm about to accelerate the time factor. And I'm going to accelerate the favor factor. And I'm going to launch you somewhere you didn't even think you would be. And some people have been believing for for a long time. But God is putting you on somebody's heart. Somebody somewhere is talking about you. Somebody somewhere is thinking about you. Somebody in high places is going to see Ruth just trying to take care of her mama and say, well, here's hands full of purpose. Don't stop her. Increase her. Accelerate her in, in, in a short matter of time. Let her go further than she did in the last decade because somebody is releasing favor. I pray that over your life, supernatural favor flow. That you be reconciled with what God has said you are and come to the knowledge of him about your identity instead of them in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I love you. I bless you. I declare favor over you. I appreciate you, and I thank God that your time is coming. You are made for this hour, and you need to get settled in your spirit about who you are. And that assignment I gave you will be the first step to learning who you are in Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you.